Good day. Um, good to be here with you. Uh, what, a, what a joy it's been over these past few years to, to meet this way uh, with you uh, via YouTube or wherever you find this. And I, um, I so appreciate each and every one of you, even, even if you don't spend the whole time listening to the whole thing, but if God would somehow bless you with what you do here, with what you do respond to. And I so appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you so much for inviting me into your homes or your places or wherever this comes to you. Um, so here we are. Another week has gone by. And I uh, was kind of looking at a number of things in my preparation. And I came across this blog from Ligonier. A uh, blog from October 2015 called The Nearness of God in His Word. And in that blog, the question is asked, quote, how do we experience the nearness of God? Now, as we think about that, if we were to take a survey amongst ourselves, um, we would probably, no, we would come up with a variety of answers and opinions. And some of those answers and opinions would fall into different categories, maybe more of a sentimental category for some. And others uh, would come across maybe in a more biblical or theological explanation. And others, well, who knows? We haven't done that survey, so I don't know. We don't know. However, with this question in mind, the Ligonier blog asked further questions. Quote, how many would say that they experienced the nearness of the Lord in his word? Or... How many of us would say that we sense that God is near when we are reading and meditating on the Word of God? You know, as we consider these questions and ponder these questions, it should remind us that any answer that we might come up with will be in large part influenced and definitely impacted by what we believe about the Bible, what you and I believe about the Word of God. Now, this uh, blog was written in 2015, uh, seven years later, uh, in 2022, during the summer, uh, Gallup uh, released a, uh, a poll and their findings concerning how Americans viewed the Bible. And I want to share some of those numbers, uh, just sort of to make a point or two. 20% of the Americans surveyed during this, uh, this particular poll said the Bible is the literal word of God. Now, according to the survey, this was down from 24% uh, who said the same thing in 2017 survey. And this 20% represented about half of what Americans believed about the Bible in 1980. We also found in that poll, in that survey, 29% of Americans surveyed said the Bible is a collection of, quote, fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. Now, of course, there's much more to this survey. You can find it online yourself. Just Google, um, I guess, um, Gallup uh, Survey 2022, what the Americans think about the Bible. But anyways, there's much more to the survey, but in summation, what the survey reveals is that the USA, and then we think of the broader context, certainly in the West, that biblical orthodox beliefs about the Bible and other things are on the decline. So here's the point made, I think. How we view our Bibles will have a direct impact on how we will answer the question that we found in that blog, how do you experience the nearness of God in his word? Well, let's ponder this as we move along. We go to Matthew's Gospel the um, 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And there we find uh, Ma Ma Matthew's account of Jesus with his disciples on the Mount of Olives. There, Jesus uh, speaking to his disciples concerning the signs of the end of the age and his return. And he said a number of things up there, but I just want to share you uh, this one thing that Jesus said on the Mount of Olives. Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away. Matthew 24, verse 35. Well, with all this in mind, please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119 as we continue in our sermon series, The Path to Life. Today, we're going to pick it up in verse 145 through to 
152. Psalm 119, verse 145. The psalmist said, With my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord. I will keep your statutes. I call to you, save me, that I may observe your testimonies. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love. O Lord, according to your justice, give me life. They draw near who persecute me with evil purpose. They are far from your law. But you are near, O Lord. All your commandments are true. Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your word. We thank you for this time together in this way, by these means. I pray, Lord, that you would just be honored and glorified in this message today, that it would do as the Bible said it would do to accomplish its work according to your purpose and, word and will. Thank you, Lord, for this time. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we continue here in Psalm 119, uh, just if you're wondering, because I'm kind of nerdy, we have up to this point dealt with approximately 82% of the 176 verses before us. And we began this verse-by-verse -verse journey through Psalm 119, believe it or not, October the 1st, 2023. Yes, we had a bit of a break there during, during Christmas, uh, I mean during Easter, and Christmas, but nonetheless, we did start back there in that first Sunday in October. You know, and I was thinking about that as I was thinking even about planning and praying about preaching through Psalm 119, I will admit to you that I was not sure that some something we could do for a variety of reasons. One of them, of course, was the challenge of working through this type of scripture, uh, all 176 verses, but I'm grateful that we've been on this journey. I hope you have too. For me, it's been a great joy and a challenge at times, uh, most, most of the times actually, to study and prepare week by week over the past several months through this wonderful psalm. And I believe that we have, and I hope you have been blessed you know, as we have been invited into the mind and heart of this Old Testament saint. My friends, this was a real person who lived a very long time ago, well, a long time ago in a different culture, in a different place, who had been dealing with their own trials and afflictions. These were real trials and real afflictions, even trouble from others. Why? Because he had a love of God and his word. You know, this is contrary to the naysayers of our day that would condemn the word of God to the dusty fairy tales, if you will, of a library. Here we have experienced a man who loved God, with all his heart, mind, and strength. A real human person, not some digital representation that is the rage of our current context. We have encountered along the way also the living God, the creator of heaven and earth, drawing near to the psalmist in each and every verse that we have encountered here. Comforting and encouraging the psalmist to stay true to his faith in his creator, his God. A faith that at times, remember folks, as you read through this, I'm sure you've seen it, that was tossed here and there in the tempest of his life. God revealing his goodness, his covenant love, his, his said, his righteousness in this inspired word that we have, that he had in his hand. This held the psalmist, as we have seen, steadfast on the mountaintops, top of joy and in the deep valleys, the trials and tribulations, and those places in between. So as we look at our stanza now, in context, what we find here is what is referred to as a lament. Please notice with me how the psalmist expressed himself here in these initial verses of our stanza. The psalmist said, with my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord. I call to you, save me, I rise before dawn and cry for help. That's in verse 145, 146, and 147 in the first part of each of those verses. The psalmist expressed his feelings of helplessness and anguish. 
He called out to God, if you notice with me, with a whole heart here in verse 145. This is a calling out from that place of a person's thoughts, his emotions, his will, his desire, his conscience that, that we call the heart. And here the psalmist lamenting, expressing his anguish through this form of poetry, his Hebrew poetry. As we think about lament, we, we should notice that the lament is not foreign to the word of God. We have a whole book called Lamentation in the Old Testament. It's right after Jeremiah. Again, this is Hebrew poetry expressing in that instant, in that book of Lamentations, uh, the anguish of the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, and the captivity of Judah into Babylon, exiled to Babylon. The book of Lamentations, my dear friends, is Judah's lament. We find King David, even in his own life, would turn to lament in his poetry. For example, King David said, Give ear to my words, Yahweh. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I pray. Uh, Psalm 5, verse 1 and 2. What was, what was the king, what was King David groaning about? Well, if you read through that psalm, you'll see that his soul lamented over the wickedness and evil in his time and context. He lamented of those who spoke lies and dealt in deceit uh, that David called his enemies. We'll come back to our text, friends. Notice the phrase here in verse 146, save me. The psalmist cried out, save me. The original Hebrew word here meaning in this context to save, to deliver, to save from ruin, destruction, or harm. So we ask the question, what brought on this earnest, deeply felt lament of our psalmist? Well, the answer here is in, found in verse 150. The psalmist said, they draw near. Who's they? Those who persecute me with evil purpose, they are far from your law. As you have gone through um, and meditated and studied Psalm 119, perhaps, perhaps you have discovered that the psalmist's trials and tribulations began earlier on in the psalm. For example, verse 22, the psalmist said to the Lord, take away from me scorn and contempt. So sort of a recap, we find that the Lamont, Lamont, the Lamont <laughs> that's a town, a town just down the road from here, Lament is found in many places of our Bibles, folks. And the reasons for the lament are many and varied. We've seen that the writers of the Bible at the time lamenting their specific circumstances and experiences. At times we find the writers expressing what's called a communal or national lament, like in the Book of Lamentations. Other times the writer is expressing a lament over the wickedness and evil of their context. And often the lament we find in the scriptures is expressed over personal and corporate sin. Just check out Psalm 51. And at times, as we've seen, it's expressed for multiple reasons. So we need to ask the question, or we will ask the question, what exactly is the lament in the biblical context? Well, let's begin by stating what it is not. The obvious, it is not whining. It's not directing a complaint toward enemies or trials or afflictions. It's not a biblical command. It's not a prophetic statement. So what is a lament in the biblical context? Well, part of the answer or some of the answer or a help to the find the answer is right here in the stanza before us. The psalmist here was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write a prayer to Yahweh. And the object of his prayer God himself. The psalmist's prayer is not only expressed here in a lament, but it is in response to the revelation of God that the psalmist found in the word of God. Associate Pastor Rob Brockman from Aurelia, Ontario, describes the lament as, quote, a form of praise and prayer with an intent of drawing close to God in times of great suffering and pain. I think Pastor Rob is on to something, folks. He goes on to say that the lament is, quote, a wonderful gift to the children of God because it presupposes a relationship with God and depends on it. So I asked the question, or we asked the question, does the biblical record support 
these statements from Pastor Rob? Well, of course. Just look at our Psalm 119. All of this points to a faithful servant of Yahweh praising God for his character and nature, praising God and crying out at the same time in lament for the circumstances which had brought him uh, much anguish and pain. I think Pastor Rob is bang on when he said this, quote, just as, as much, just as much as Christian, as the Christian ought to come before God with songs of thanksgiving and praise, we ought to come before God with lament. Indeed, Pastor Rob, we should. We look at the book of Psalms as a whole. There's 150 Psalms in there. Approximately 65 of them are Psalms of lament. Well, let's go back to our text. We find the psalmist here directing his complaint to God. The psalmist said, With my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord. I call to you, save me. I rise before dawn and cry for help. Verse 145 to 147. Then we see the psalmist describing his suffering. Verse 150, the psalmist said, They draw near who persecute me with evil purposes. And then the psalmist turning to God to come to the aid of his people, to come to the aid of him, the psalmist. He said, hear my voice according to your steadfast love, O Lord, according to your justice, give me life. Verse 149. And finally, in the midst of his trials and, trial and affliction, even in the middle of all that, he considers the goodness and faithfulness of God in his life. But you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. Verse 151. A gentleman by the name of Nicholas Wolterstorff published a lament for his son in 1987. I have that book on my, on my uh, study, in my study. It's a very short book, maybe 100 pages. You see, his son Eric had died in a climbing accident in the summer of 80, 1983, four years before he published this at the age of 25. The Volter Star family were Christians. Eric was a devout Christian man. And when you read this father's lament over the death of his son, it is heartbreaking. And then Nicholas, looking back over the four years since the accidental death of his son with more questions than ever, he said this in his lament, quote, every lament is a love song. Will love songs one day no longer be laments? How about you, my friends? Have you ever cried out to God, Answer me, Lord? Did you rise up before the sun this morning and cry out for help to God? Maybe you feel like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. You, you pray, Hear my voice, give me life. You know, over the weeks in our journey through Psalm 119, we encountered reality. See, friends, life is not lived on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, or in the basement playing Mario Kart. You know, when we began our study, we stated that the Word of God is a reflection of His character and nature. Matter of fact, the premise is this. God, by His Holy Spirit, inspired the psalmist to write what he wrote so long ago, and it's been preserved for us in the Bible, in the Word of God. And we were invited at the very beginning and all through this into the life and time of the psalmist. We have encountered a just and holy, righteous, good, kind, loving creator God. And we've discovered God who beyond all that we could imagine or think. And this time, and we think about that, we have barely but skimmed the surface concerning the doctrine of God that is revealed for us here in these 176 verses of Psalm 119. So when we look at verse 145 to 152, the psalmist gave us his answer to the question, how do you experience the nearness of God in his word? It was in his trials and tribulations, even as some drew near him, we hear here in this, saw, in this section, with evil purpose, the psalmist in a real and tangible way experienced the nearness of God in his word. It's reminiscent of what Paul said to the Philippians and reminds us today 
Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness uh, be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5 to 7. So we want to consider now for a moment or two the biblical doctrine of God. We can't miss it here. It's standing out and right in our faces. We can't obviously be comprehensive. The time is not here to do that. But we want to look at the attributes of God, those attributes that, they, that God does not share with you and me. We want to look at the attribute of God's omnipresence. We have no choice in this format and the time we have, but to keep it simple, and let me just say what Wayne Grudem suggests in his Bible, uh, in his work called The Bible Doctrine, Second Edition, concerning the omnipresence of God. Grudem said, quote, Just as God is unlimited, as God is infinite with respect to time, so God is unlimited with respect to space, end quote. Please hang in there with me. Let's just take a look at this from one aspect of this attribute of the omnipresence of God. And that, and that aspect is God is present everywhere. God is present everywhere. We'll go to Jeremiah. And there God said, Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord? and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23 and 24. And we find that God in this particular passage, in this chapter uh, of Jeremiah's, uh, of, of the book of Jeremiah, uh, God was rebuking the prophets who thought their words and and their, and their thoughts were hidden from God. King David would suggest otherwise when we turn to Psalm 139. Psalm 139 in your Bibles, chapter 7, uh, Psalm 139, pardon me, verse 7 to 10, goes like this. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Well, I think it's very clear just from these samples, uh, examples from God's word, that God is present everywhere. And as we think about these, this, uh, this aspect of God, we have to be very careful not to press it beyond the confines of the biblical examples that we have of the Bible. It constrains us when we consider this. We have to be careful not to press it too far. For example, some have gone on to say that God is everything. In other words, God and the universe are one and the same. This idea is called pantheism. Pantheism, which is found in the teachings of Eastern religions such as Buddhism and Hinduism, and here in the West explains the worldviews of Christian science and Scientology. It also explains the foundation of the New Age religions as well, and sadly, a lot of this, is, this pantheistic idea of God has found its way into the evangelical church as well. However, we can also press this attribute of God a different direction. For example, we find this in places in the word of faith, teaching, the prosperity gospel, etc., in varying degrees. I don't do this lightly, but I want to share uh, one particular person in the word of faith who's been doing this for many decades. Kenneth Copeland is one word of faith preacher who has taught for decades, decades and I just want to quote him directly, that God, quote, is much like you and me, a being that stands around six foot two inches or six foot four, three inches that weighs around a couple hundred pounds and has a hand span of nine inches across. You know what Copeland was doing here? He was twisting the word of God, particularly in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. You can check that out for yourself. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. Read it in context. Don't just read that verse. So we can't press this 
uh, uh, God is present everywhere far beyond the demands that are placed on it by the Bible. So keeping this in mind, we return to our stanza and encounter a God who is present everywhere. Another term that's often used is imminence, that God is always near and present to his creation. The Bible teaches that God has promised to manifest his presence in special ways and at special times to the lives of the people. For example, in the Old Testament, we find him revealing himself in the tabernacle, in the temple, and on Mount Sinai, and other places. And then in the New Testament, we have the day of Pentecost, and so forth, and so on. And we also see that at times, God uh, reveals himself even in the everyday mundane things of life. So as we're looking at the stanza and considering all these things, we find a contrast here. Please notice the persecutors in verse 150 who uh, the psalmist said, draw near me or draw near with evil purpose. What? To do harm for the psalmist, but they are far from your law. So they're far from God. Then we see the contrast with the psalmist who was confident that God would rescue him as he described the nearness of God, as he praised the truth of the word of God in verse 151 and 152. And I hope, my dear ones, that you've noticed the connection here between the psalmist's sense that God is near and his confidence in the truth of God's worth. Here we have on display right here in this psalm the imminence of God. The nearness of God who comes alongside his word to make it effective for his will and purpose. We find that as Isaiah describes it in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10 and 11. God said, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do, and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Wonderful, wonderful text. Wonderful, wonderful text. I want to close with a quote from Nicholas Wolterstroff's lament. Quote, perhaps there's something more in what Jesus meant. Not only is there a new day of peace coming, to those who mourn, the absence of that day is disclosed already the heart of God. Upon entering the company of the suffering, they discern the anguish of God. By his anguish, they are comforted. Upon joining the crowd on the bench of mourning, they hear the sobs and see the tears of God. But these, by these, they are consoled. The psalmist said, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Psalm 126, verse 5 and 6. Dear ones, let us pray. Our Lord God, thank you. And I just want to pray for my friends who are hearing this. If they made it through this far, I thank you for that, Lord. But I pray in whatever place they are, whatever circumstance, whatever maybe trial or suffering or whatever's going on in their life that is hard, I pray that they would know the nearness of God in his word, that they would open up the pages of the Bible and drink of the cool waters of God's word, of the sustaining peace in the midst of trouble that you give us as we read these wonderful, wonderful wonderful verses in the Bible. Oh Lord, thank you so much for your word. It strengthens us. It convicts us. It brings hope in the midst of hopelessness and so much more. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks folks. God bless. Shalom.